All right. Well, hey, good afternoon from beautiful Omaha, Nebraska, where I like to say the sun always shines. And my special guest today is Dr. Mark Chires from the Omaha of the Atlantic Ocean, Puerto Rico. Uh, this is Jonathan with Alpha Watch. And as I said, I've got Dr. Mark Chires in Puerto Rico today, and we got to talk some biotech stuff. Mark, what's it like in Puerto Rico today? Yeah, Jonathan, I think uh, it's consistently nice in Puerto Rico. It's a beach day as, uh, as usual. The beach day, it's not the Missouri River, but it's almost as good as Nebraska. <laughs> well, hey, let's go. I, I'm dying to talk to you. So since June 15th, I'm looking at my numbers right here. Since June 15th, the S&B Biotech Select Industry Index is up 36%. The S&P is up 10%. What's going on? Why, why are we seeing the S&P Biotech doing so well? in the summer of all times in the summer what's your what's 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 happening yeah no great observation jonathan and i think you know maybe we can set the table a little bit for the context because i think it's important and that is you know the the s p select biotech index is has been in the midst of the longest and deepest drawdown in its history we haven't ever seen a pullback like this and Maybe the best way for, for you know, investors to think about it is it's about a year ahead of the broad index. So it's about a year ahead of the S&P. Yeah. The pullback started in the second quarter of 2021, um, and it's about 65 plus percent peak to trough. So just, you know, really dramatic drawdown. So we were starting from pretty depressed levels. And I think that, you know, investors sort of in the middle of June, as you alluded to, you know, were kind of reminded by, you know, some robust quarterly earnings, some good data and some M&A that, Hey, this biotech sector is poised to continuously create a lot of value, and you know maybe there's a bit of the baby thrown out with the bathwater. Mm. Is this sustainable? Is this a what? What's the vernacular like a dead cat bounce? As we kind of hear in recession talk, do you think it's going to keep going, flatten out? What, I mean, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, certainly we become more constructive. You know, we we feel that you know there's a strong case to be made that the low is in for this pullback. Um, you know, a couple metrics that might be helpful. So, you know, the number of companies that were trading below cash, so at a negative enterprise value, um, eclipsed 200 companies. So we've we, we never seen 200 companies, publicly traded biotech companies that are trading below the value of the cash on their balance sheets. This is just a remarkable pullback, right? And I, I think because of you know, I think that that statistic highlights how dramatic the pullback has been. I can also quote multiples for some large cap uh, pharma and biotech companies, Jonathan. You know, a lot of yeah. these companies are trading at single digit multiples with pretty robust growth and, you know, very strong cash flow. Right. So I, I would say the sector is, you know, pretty depressed in terms of valuations. And um, because of, you know, the basis being so low, you know, even, you know, uh, the move we've seen, you know, I would still say valuations, you know, haven't gotten out of hand. You know, maybe there's a stock or two here or there that's gotten a little bit um, crowded and rich. But I would say, by and large, you know, the the mean and median value are, is still quite attractive. Gotcha. What did what what did interest rates have to do with this, if anything? Well, I think that you know, cost of capital generally does affect earlier stage companies, you know, companies that are dependent upon, you know, raising risk capital to fund development activities. And, you know, biotech is the largest sector of non-revenue generating publicly traded companies, right? There's, there's, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred publicly traded biotech companies, depending upon how you, you know, do math on them and, you know, characterize them. Uh, but suffice it to say that, you know, all of the pre-commercial stage companies, all of their development activities are funded by you know, investment dollars put on balance sheets through financing transactions. And so to the extent where cost of capital is going up, it's going to affect those companies. You know, fortunately, if you look at the other side of the business model, the commercial stage companies, these are very high gross and net margin businesses right. with, you know, very strong pricing power, et cetera. So, you know, their exposure to interest rates and margins is minimal. So you kind of have a barbell effect here where, you know, the mm -hmm. earlier stage companies are perhaps more exposed. Oh, but here's the good news for active investors is that there's a lot of companies out there that are very well capitalized from, you know, before interest rate, uh, the cycle started raising, right? So you, right. you have companies with three, four, five years of cash that exist today. Those companies are well positioned, whereas those that, you know, might be more exposed to interest rate risk, to your point, that need to raise capital in the near term, you know, those might be under some more pressure. 
Gotcha. Well, what are you worried about? You have to be worried about something. It can't all be roses going forward that this is the worst we've ever seen. How could it be any worse? Is there anything that you're worried about? Well, certainly there's always a lot to worry about in biotech, mm, right? Good, I mean, okay. <laughs> you know, the so the you know, the biggest challenge is is that it's very difficult to create a differentiated product that meets critical unmet needs, right? So right. to get a drug approved is no small feat. And you know, a lot of endeavors are ultimately unsuccessful. So, you know, biggest challenge, and this is always true, regardless of, you know, the economic cycle that you're in, is, you know, the success rate is, is you know, is, is well under 50% for new drug mm -hmm. development, right? Yeah. So there's that. Um, there's a couple other headwinds to touch on, right? So the, you know, there's recently been some drug price legislation embedded within the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. You know, clearly there are some types of drugs um, within you know, the large development universe that's out there that are going to be impacted by this. It's going to cap some investment in certain areas and it's going to cap returns in certain areas. Um, by no means am I suggesting that, you know, the endeavor of developing new drugs is compromised, you know, holistically from this legislation, but at the margin, it is an incremental negative and there, there will be some products that are affected. So, you know, those are a couple of things. And then the third, as I kind of mentioned, maybe just to, you know, call it out more explicitly is dilution risk, right? So again, for companies that need to raise capital in the near term that don't have the luxury of a healthy balance sheet that is going to carry them into 2025 or 2026, you know, you're probably going to see larger dilution than you might otherwise see. Gotcha. Well, Nebraskans are optimistic. What are you excited about then? What's, what's there to look forward to in the short term here, next six months short term? Yeah, a lot to be excited about. So, you know, we okay. talk a lot about M&A, Jonathan, um, you know, yeah. a lot of factors driving it. But just to hit a couple summary points, you know, number one, the large pharmaceutical and biotech companies have a growth mandate that includes externally sourcing innovative products. So they all need to buy things to to, you know, augment their already stated um, financial growth and long term projection. So, you know, strategically, yeah. there's no question this is happening. And, uh, you know, there's a strong tailwind to M&A as well right now because all the, the sort of the, the, the profits generated from COVID-19 therapeutics and vaccines, of which there's, you know, more than 100 billion now on balance sheets wow. today, um, a lot of that capital is going to be redeployed in sourcing external innovation. So M&A, you're going to see more deals. So, so two, um, you know, sort of secondary to that, you know, valuations are reset. You were kind of talking about this pullback, right? Longest and deepest in the history of the sector. Even with the rebound, there's a lot of companies that are still on sale, still attractively priced. Um, we think M&A is going to be a continuous part of the narrative in the near and, and sort of intermediate and long term for the sector. So that's something to be excited about. And we are. Um, the, you know, the, the second big category of excitement, I would say, is you know, there's a lot of really exciting, innovative products being developed, um, you know, and part of what you've seen in the turnaround since June is, you know, there's been a couple of very high profile clinical data sets that have come out that have surprised to the upside in terms of expectations that have showed that, you know, these companies, you know, really do have very exciting, differentiated clinical products. Yeah. And, and, you know, the more great data we see, Jonathan, the more it reminds, you know, investors broadly that, you know, there's a lot of good that comes from this sector. And, you, you know, as the successes start piling up, um, uh, you know, I think folks want to get involved in the sector and start seeing some of the, you know, rewards. Because I'll give you a couple examples, right? You know, companies that, that can produce differentiated data. Um, you know, there was there was a few recently. One in um, in a you know, central nervous system disorder. There was another in um, a, a COPD indication that's a, a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, and another in an orphan indication called thyroid eye disease. Each of those individual companies that reported that data, Jonathan, stock was up fifty to seventy five percent that day. Day, holy cow! Yes, and 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 they deserve to be. Uh, because, sure. you know, you, you, you know, you, you produce differentiated data that's clearly a product and you can see appreciation. So, you know, those are a couple of things we're pretty excited about. And maybe just to round it out, you know, yeah. you know, I, I talked about dilution risk, um, you know, for, for current shareholders. But there's also an opportunity for for investors that can take part and participate in these refinancing deals. And that is, you know, if you're the investor that's that's doing you know, the recapitalization of the company that's funding it to its next milestone, 
sure, the existing investors are getting diluted, uh, but the new investors coming in are actually, you know, getting a very attractive cost basis for a later stage asset that they might otherwise have the opportunity to invest in. So, you know, yeah. I, I would say that the deal landscape cuts both ways, right? There's dilution risk for the sector and current shareholders. There's opportunity for the new new investors coming in uh, that are doing the recapitalizations. Man, biotech to me is such about what to buy and what not to buy. And I think like what not to buy might almost be more important in biotech than even like what to buy. That just seems to be my experience in the space. All right, well, we need to wrap up, man. I had to get you on the phone because so much going on. Interesting. One thing which do we do at Alpha Watch is we have the Alpha Watch wind up. 30 seconds. Give me a pitch. What do you need to tell people if you only had 30 seconds? Elevator's on its way up. Go. Yeah, no, thank you, Jonathan. I think, you know, the high level is biotech sector coming out of the longest and deepest pullback in its history, clearly seeing signs of life, some exciting tailwinds for new product development cycles, ramping up M&A, reset valuations, an opportunity to, um, you know, see recapitalization deals create and unlock value. A um, lot of tailwinds. Oh, and, and the best part of it is, is that it's a demand and elastic sector that, you know, is, is going to perform well, regardless of the macroeconomic environment. So mm. a great time to take a look. There we go. Ding, we reached the floor. Well, Alpha Watch people, thank you. Mark, you're the man. Appreciate you being available at a short notice. Please subscribe to our Alpha Watch video. Subscribe to our Alpha Watch website. More good stuff from people like Dr. Mark Dress. Thanks so much for your time. Enjoy Puerto Rico, but make sure you come out and visit us in Nebraska soon. It's a good time to visit in the fall. Go Huskers. <laughs> thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks. See you, Mark. We'll talk to you soon.